Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 African American Film Series. This is our first video conference panel discussion of the Black History Month Film Series. I'll be your moderator for this series. My name is Dr. Karen Krieger. I'm a professor of family and geriatric medicine at the University of Louisville School of Medicine, director of health equity of the Health Sciences Center, and endowed chair in urban policy for the Foundation of Healthy Kentucky at the University of Louisville. This series is in its third year. It's a collaborative venture between the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and the Health Sciences Center, University of Louisville, the Louisville Free Public Library, and new partner this year, Lean Into Louisville. I'd like to thank our host, Paul Burns, from the Louisville Free Public Library for helping make the series happen each Sunday afternoon in February. Normally, we conduct this film series in the main branch of the Louisville Free Public Library with panel discussions following the two o'clock airing of the film. This year, because of COVID, we're on a video platform. The panels will start immediately after the ending of the film with a 2 p.m. Sunday streaming start time. Our panel is starting at 4.15 and it'll have a 5 p.m. ending. You may submit your questions and comments on the Facebook chat which will be communicated to our panel. As always, we value your opinions about our productions, so please complete the survey, survey that's going to be emailed to you on each film the day after the airing of the film. Our film this week is Harriet, about Harriet Tubman in the pre-Civil War era. I'll introduce each panelist in turn, and after I've made all introductions, the panelists will have five to 10 minutes to give their impressions of the film before we entertain audience questions and comments. I'm very pleased to welcome back Professor Cedric Merlin Powell. Cedric Merlin Powell is the law school professor receiving his BA with honors in politics from Oberlin College in 1984 and his JD in 1987 from the New York University School of Law, where he served as managing editor of the New York University Review of Law and Social Change. Prior work experiences include a judicial clerkship with the Honorable Julia Cooper Mack of the DC Court of Appeals from 1987 to 1988, a one-year term as a Carpathian Fellow in the National Office of the American Civil Liberties Union in New York from 88 to 89, and as a litigator associate with the New York law firm of Skadden, Arts, Slate, Meager, and Prom from 89 to 93. He's a member of the Ohio and New York State Bars and is admitted to practice before the Supreme Court of the United States and the federal courts of the Second and Sixth Circuits and the Southern and Eastern Districts of New York. Professor Powell has written over a broad range of topics, including affirmative action and critical race theory, the First Amendment and hate speech, and the 14th Amendment and structural inequality. And we're very happy to have him back with us this year. Our second panelist for this film will be Julie Leitner. This is her first time as a panelist for our series and we welcome her wholeheartedly. She is the museum educator for the Carnegie Center for Arts and History in downtown New Albany, Indiana a branch of the Floyd County Public Library System. The Carnegie System Center serves the local community with free rotating contemporary art exhibitions and a permanent collection of historic art and artifacts. She creates educational programming for children revolving around the Carnegie Center's mission and exhibitions, which include two permanent history exhibitions, Ordinary People, Extraordinary Courage, Men and Women of the Underground Railroad, and the second permanent exhibition is Remembered, the life of Lucy Higgs Nichols. Lucy Higgs Nichols was a Civil War nurse who escaped from slavery to settle in New Albany in the 1960s. Julie has designed and presented programs about Lucy Higgs and Ms. Nichols for over a thousand students in Louisville and New Albany elementary schools since joining the Carnegie Center to help find the youth educational program. She started that in 2019. Last year, she worked with a group of third graders at a public school in New Albany over the course of seven months to write, illustrate, and self-publish a picture book about Lucy Higgs Nichols called Before She Was Free. In addition to her work with the Carnegie Center, Julie has been a visual artist and youth art educator in the Louisville region for nearly 10 years, serving as artist in residence at St. Francis High School, 
designing children's programs for the Speed Art Museum and mentoring bachelors of fine art candidates in the fine arts departments at Spalding University, Bellarmine, and Indiana University South. She's a graduate of the University of Louisville Bachelor of Fine Arts program in 2006 and a Rhode Island School of Design graduate Masters of Fine Arts in 2010. She curated an experimental exposition space called Scheherazade in Louisville from 2018 to 2020, and she's a recipient of many awards in the Louisville area. The Kentucky Foundation for Women, Louisville Visual Arts, the Community Foundation of Louisville, and the Great Meadows Foundation were some of the awards that she's received in our area. Our third panelist is Dr. Nicholas McQuad. And we're going to say welcome back because when we had Nicholas on our panel before, he was a doctoral candidate in the Departments of Pan African Studies at the University of Louisville. He graduated with a BA in history from Bucknell University in 2011. In 2016, he obtained his Master's of Arts degree in Pan African Studies from the University of Louisville with a concentration in African diaspora history. The doctoral uh, dissertation entitled Practicing Pan-Africanism, British Caribbean Intellectuals to post Independence in Ghana. I am happy to say that Professor McQuaud graduated uh, with a PhD from the Pan-African Studies Department at the University of Louisville in 2020, and he's now an assistant professor at Ryder University in New Jersey. So that's our panel. Let us have each one give a little um, impression about the film Harriet. Then after that, we'll entertain questions and comments from our audience. And those of you who have been with us in the prior years know the kind of energy that we generate with these presentations. I'm hoping we can recreate that on the video platform. So think of your questions, be getting them in. Um, they're coming in on your live Facebook chat, and they'll be sent over to us on our Zoom. We'll start with um, Professor Powell. What do you think? How does it apply to your work? OK. Thanks for having me. It's my honor and privilege uh, to be here. And I'm really excited to be with my uh, co-panelists. It's uh, always good to work with uh, scholars in this area and people who are doing the work on the ground. So I'm really happy to be here. I wanna talk about three things when I talk about the movie Harriet. I wanna talk about the concept of property and oppression, the codification of slaves as property, and finally some brief remarks about what I think we're in, and I call that the third reconstruction. Other people have used that term, but I think it's important to look at our history and center it and make connections to what is happening presently. So let me talk about the concept of property and oppression, chattel slavery. Throughout Harriet, you see these images resonating. You belong to me, slaves as a possession. Favorite slave is a pig. Commodities to buy and sell. Restitution and compensation for spoiled goods if the slave is particularly rebellious. There's even a quote in the movie that says, our stature in this community is measured in negras, Negroes for sale, white slave owners as perverse economic victims, compensation if your rebellious slave infects others with the desire for freedom and self-determination. A slave owner even kills a black slave catcher when he says, I want Harriet alive. Note how perverse this is, a black character is brutalizing his own people only to be brutalized himself because life is black life is utterly expendable and slavery is so diabolically evil that he actually thinks that he's equal because of his work for the slave catching master. So that is concept of property and oppression. Those concepts are codified in the slave as property. So slave labor was essential in building this country. Slavery was only abolished 155 years ago. The White House, the United States Capitol were built by slaves. Jefferson's Monticello in Charlottesville, Virginia was built by slaves. Trinity Church near Wall Street, the, the high spire was built by rented slave labor. 
Georgetown University was built from the profits of selling 272 slaves and Harvard Law School was built by slaves. So labor was conceptualized in society and the law to perpetuate oppression and subjugation of African-American people. If you read W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction in America, his 1935 uh, landmark work, he says this, the system of slavery demanded a special police force and such a force was made possible and unusually effective by the presence of poor whites. Considering the economic rivalry of the black and white worker in the North, it would have seemed natural that the poor white would have refused to police slaves, but two considerations led him in the opposite direction. First of all, it gave him work and some authority as overseer, slave driver, and member of the patrol system. And above and beyond this, he never considered himself as a laborer or as part of a labor movement. He wanted to be just like the master and his ultimate ambition was to own some slaves. To these slaves, he transferred all the dislike and hatred which he held for the whole slave system. The result was a system that was stable and intact by poor whites. So once labor is commodified, there is a need to rationalize the system of oppression within a society that professes to embrace democracy and freedom. So the codification of chattel slavery really rests on these themes, dehumanization, brutalization, commodification, criminalization. The law embraced, advanced, and reified these themes. For example, 1829 case State versus John Mann, North Carolina, it says the power of the master is absolute and unqualified. There was also a case, Prigg versus Pennsylvania, that's as important as 1842. In that case, the US Supreme Court held the Federal Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, the precursor to the 1850 uh, Act constitutional. The main thing in this act was to secure to the citizens of the slaveholding states the complete right and title of ownership in their slaves as property in every state in the union into which they might escape from the state where they were held in servitude. So states did not have to offer aid at this point in capturing slaves, but the owner of a slave was cloaked with entire authority in every state in the union to seize and recapture his slave. There's another case, 1855, Kennedy versus Mason would said that Kennedy, the overseer who had damaged property was liable for the value of the slave in question. So all of this leads us to the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which was part of the Compromise of 1850 and passed by the Congress on September 18th, 1850. The act required that slaves be returned to their owners, even if they were in a free state. So the act also made the federal government responsible for finding, returning, and trying escaped slaves. In a film you hear this referred to as the Bloodhound Bill, because now law enforcement officers were responsible for apprehending escaped slaves. In response to the weakening of the first Fugitive Slave Act in 1793, this act had added teeth. It penalized officials who did not arrest a runaway slave uh, and made them liable for a fine of $1,000, which in today's money is like $30,000. Law enforcement officials everywhere were required to arrest people suspected of being a runaway slave on a simple claim, sworn testimony of ownership. There was no trial. And in fact, there was an incentive in a trial for the commissioner hearing the trial to find that the person was a runaway slave because he was compensated $10 if he was found, if he found the individual to be a fugitive and only $5 if he determined the proof to be insufficient to prove that the slave was a fugitive. In addition, any person aiding a runaway slave by providing food or shelter was subject to six months imprisonment and a $1,000 fine. So officers who captured a fugitive slave were entitled to a bonus or promotion for their work. 
So slaves only needed, slave owners, I'm sorry, only needed to supply a simple affidavit to a federal marshal to capture an escaped slave. And since an escaped slave was not eligible for trial, the law resulted in kidnapping, conscription of free blacks into slavery, as you saw in some of the scenes, uh, as suspected slaves had no rights in court and could not defend themselves against accusations. Then behind this, you have Dred Scott, which really isn't talked about in the movie, but 1856 case, uh, looking at the constitutionality of the Missouri Compromise. Court concluded that Dred Scott was not a federal citizen, could not bring suit to claim his uh, freedom in the US Supreme Court, had no right to sue, and Congress lacked the power to enact the Missouri Compromise. Just five years later, we're in the Civil War. Many people think that the Fugitive Slave Act of 1855, Dred Scott, all led to the Civil War. And then finally, I just want to briefly talk about uh, common applications to what I call the Third Reconstruction. So we know right after the Civil War, there was a 12-year period where we had uh, Reconstruction. We had the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments being passed, but they did not even leave, live up to their potential until 100 years later uh, when we do the Civil Rights uh, Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965, Fair Housing Act of 1968. Uh, 100 years later, we tried to get where we should have been uh, during the first Reconstruction. That was the second Reconstruction. And I'll, I think that when we mark the end of President Obama's presidency, we're in the third Reconstruction. It's no accident that we're seeing insurrections, the Southern flag being flown in the United States Capitol. We are still actually fighting uh, the Civil War. And so there are direct applications to the slavery that we saw in Harriet Tubman to our discussion about criminal justice in a carceral state. In fact, the only thing that's missing is we don't have chattel slavery now, but we have a new type of commodification here, and that is the privatization of prisons the criminal industrial complex, the carceral state. And so all of these factors lead up to the discussion that we're having today. Dehumanization, criminalization, now disproportionate response to black bodies and legitimized police violence. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Powell, for that uh, very complete synopsis of the legalities pre-Civil War and now. And Professor Powell will be back with us uh, for the second insurrection in the movie Detroit, which will be the last movie of our series on February the 28th. Ms. Leitner, tell us about what's in our own backyard and how that can relate to the film that we viewed today. Yes, um, well, I just wanna say thank you to Dr. Krieger for inviting me here. I, I feel very um, humbled and honored to, to be um, on the panel with, with um, everyone else that's here today. I work at the Carnegie Center for Art and History in New Albany, and um, we have two exhibitions that are permanent there that explore some of the history of not just the Underground Railroad, but um, the state of race relations in New Albany and Louisville pre-Civil War and during the Civil War. And um, well, when I was, I, my job is to communicate a lot of that to children. So I'm a museum educator. I mostly work with kids and I've taught about over a thousand at this point, children in grades third through five, um, specifically about one woman named Lucy Higgs Nichols, who has a story that in many ways parallels some of Harriet Tubman's life. And um, the, that exhibition is separate from our other exhibition called um, Extraordinary People, Ordinary Cur excuse me, Ordinary People, Extraordinary Courage, um, the men and women of the Underground Railroad. And, and that has earned us as a, as a museum membership in the National Park Service, National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. Um, which basically means that we are a site that has verifiable connections to the Underground Railroad in some way. And in our case, that means that we have artifacts, documents, primary sources that show um, that there was activity um, 
uh, of white abolitionists and free blacks um, working in New Albany um, during that period of time. Um, and the exhibition gets into certain specific individuals. It really was kind of headquartered at the second, um, second Presbyterian Church in downtown New Albany, which is still standing today. They call it the Town Clock Church, and actually it's still an active church. They call it the Second Baptist Church today. But there, um, we have evidence written, written um, personal letters from various people who were, um, who we believe were uh, aiding freedom seekers and then potentially hiding them in the basement of that church. Um, and you can take a tour um, and go down into the undercroft and see that area. Um, the church, the church's pastor, uh, John Bishop and his wife, Lucy Bishop were um, rather outspoken in their uh, anti-slavery beliefs. Um, so, but I, I wanted to quickly, if I could just touch on a few of the similarities between Lucy Higgs Nichols and Harry Tubman. And people who are listening here, you guys just finished watching the movie Harriet. Um, and Lucy Higgs Nichols is, I don't wanna say she's our Harriet Tubman because that's a way oversimplification and they have very different stories. But every time I talk about Lucy Higgs Nichols to children, Harriet Tubman comes up every single time. Um, sometimes it's because I show a picture. We have one photograph of Lucy um, and they, they immediately point her out and say, it's Harriet Tubman, it's Harriet Tubman. Um, and that provides a, a kind of an important touch point that um, all children can really start with. So we're talking about their lives here. We're talking about the way that we tell their story. So let me give you a quick run through of some of their similarities. First of all, they had both been owned along with their brothers and sisters um, at a certain point in time, meaning that they were enslaved. That is an important point that um, as um, Mr. Powell mentioned uh, is central to the concept of even understanding what slavery is, is the idea of being owned, the concept of ownership and property. That's something that I have to underline with children a lot so that they actually understand what slavery actually means. Um, even in third grade, children don't understand that. So we show um, primary source documents showing you know, inventories of property that has Lucy's name on it. Um, fear of family separation seemed to be a driving motivation for both Harriet and Lucy Higgs Nichols for escaping when they did. The movie makes a point right away at the very beginning of the movie that um, fear of being separated from her husband and possibly her children was kind of one of that like marking that point that was like okay um, I'm going to make a plan to escape that's similar to what we believe happened to Lucy Higgs Nichols when she lived in Bolivar Tennessee um, at that point she actually had a child and she ran um, away from the plantation where she was working um, and joined up with the Indiana 23rd Regiment, which was part of the Union Army that was in the area at that point. Um, both of the, both women, Harriet and Lucy, had an exceptional talent and skill that um, helped them sort of elevate themselves and others. Um, and for Lucy, that meant she became a nurse. She uh, sort of originally began working as a someone to help with laundry and they recognized that she had um, skills and the doctor of the regiment trained her as a nurse. Um, I'm trying to just be as quick as possible here. There's so many interesting things about Lucy's life. I don't want to go down any rabbit holes, but um, they both had the courage to return sort of down south into the lion's den when they didn't have to. In the movie Harriet, we see that when she goes to Philadelphia, she's found relative safety and she makes the choice to return to retrieve family members. Lucy Higgs Nichols has a similar story. She actually made it to, uh, after traveling with the Union Army, she went up to New Albany with them on furlough. She could have stayed. It was a free state at that time. 
but no, she chose to kept going down with them. Um, they both ended up owning property later in life, which was an important touchstone for, for both of them in the movie. It was an important moment in the movie. It's an important uh, moment for Lucy as well. Um, and they were both very well known in their time. Um, Harriet, of course, is seen being photographed and mentions her relationship with Senator William Seward. And Lucy Higgs Nichols was written about in the New York Times. Um, she had a special act of Congress um, called Lucy's Bill that ended up giving her a, a pension, which was a huge deal at the time. Um, and um, she, Lucy was given a full military funeral when she died. So um, I see a question from Paul Burns, are Lucy's relatives still in New Albany? As far as we know, Lucy did not have any direct descendants that are still, um, that we've found. And that's because, as I mentioned, Lucy did have a daughter when she escaped and joined the Indiana 23rd Regiment, but her daughter died in the Battle of Vicksburg. Um, okay. So anyway, I, I, I've talked long enough. Uh, don't get me started on Lucy or, or I'll talk all day. So um, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Ms. Leitner. Professor McClaude, our former panelists, Professor Powell and Ms. Leitner, they have given us a very extensive history on their areas. Your Pan-African studies. And so I ask you here, because of your national view of the Underground Railroad, the things that were happening culturally to Black Americans, both free and slave, during the time of the film. So you're up next, Nick. Well, I have to say first, you know, thank you for, for having me. It's, it's an honor to, to be welcomed back again to, to engage in this discussion. Um, and I have to thank you for allowing the historian to go last. Um, <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, historians are historically and traditionally uh, long-winded, so that's, that's great. I have quite a bit of time to work with. Um, you know, I want to I want to touch on three primary things um, about the movie. Um, number one, the the significance of geography, um, the significance of how control over these enslaved populations is being represented. Um, and then life in the Northern states. Um, all of this, of course, um, having to do with um, this notion of resistance um, that we see taking place um, with this examination of the Underground Railroad that we're getting. Um, and, and so, you know, beyond this being a, a biopic um, about, about Harriet um, and, and, a, and a wonderful case study of, of enslavement in the United States. This is a movie about resistance. Um, this is a movie about agency, meaning control um, over your life choices, okay? And, and when we're thinking about resistance, we often forget that there are several scales um, of resistance. Um, and so oftentimes we think about full revolt, think about Nat Turner or Harper's Ferry or Denmark Vesey and, and, and those conspiracies. Um, but what we see in the film is that resistance has several forms from its most covert form, like Harriet's father, you know, wearing the blindfold over his eyes so that he can say, you know, I didn't see you. I haven't seen you, you know, from something as, as small and pivotal and vital as that to the plot. Um, to something as overt as the, res the resistance in the act of running um, and joining this underground network, rail, um, underground railroad network. You know, and so when we think about movement, think about migration, geographies that are taking place, uh, movement is vital to the film. Um, uh, and these discussions about runaways and the underground railroad, um, the film really gets us thinking about geography in that, you know, when we think about slavery, we think about the South. Um, and, and, and slavery was most severe in the lower South, um, you know, between these, these decades, right? The, the 1820s and the 1860s. And so during this time, we have about 1.2 million enslaved Africans um, that are in the upper South, okay? This, this Maryland, um, you know, Delaware area that we're seeing, all right? These slave populations are starting to be relocated to the lower South. All right, um, we have about half of the region's enslaved population being moved and sold down south. And when I say lower south, I mean Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas, 
Missouri, these are states that um, are, you know, becoming states, achieving statehood fairly recent, you know, it, it, it's, it's fairly recent that, they, that these territories have become states. Um, and we see slavery expanding in the South. We see slavery expanding westward. Okay, and so these are intensifying discussions about, um, you know, abolition, um, the Civil War, you know, uh, power shifting within Congress. And so the movie, number one, it makes us consider our ideas about North versus South. Uh, you know, people tend to forget that Maryland was part of the Confederacy. Um, and, and, and we don't tend to think about Maryland as being South or Southern, but, but that's really represented in the film um, when you see how, you know, Harriet, her family, the fear that they have of being sold down South, right, or, or being sold down the river, okay, um, as, we, as we, you know, traditionally say today. Um, but we know that slavery was most severe in the South. And so that fear of being sold there was a means of control, all right? Way to keep um, these enslaved populations um, de-radicalized and, and, and under the thumb and under the heel of these slave masters, okay? And so um, one of the panelists earlier was talking about this threat of being sold. Um, um, and it was common practice by masters during this time. Um, the film gives a really good glimpse of how um, this interacts with the Black family. You know, the portrayal of the Black family is very important to this movie and, and the entire narrative um, because we see not only its existence um, and, and the love that, that these, uh, these human beings all right, shared, the marriages, their children, the love for their siblings that they have, but we also see the fragility of the black family. Um, we see, you know, how these families are broken apart easily by this threat of being sold. We see Harriet's sister at the beginning of the film is sold down south. Um, we see when the, her other sister is being interrogated um, about the whereabouts of Harriet and her siblings after they fled, we see them threatening to sell the children, all right? And she immediately acquiescing um, and, 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 and telling them about their whereabouts. Um, and one of the one of the lines in the movie that really stuck with me was this was the line her sister said when she came to get her sister. She said, "Can't everybody run?" You know, um, and, and that really reflects the gender dynamics about about running uh, and, and resisting during slavery. Um, when we think about you know, for men, movement was was much easier for men during this time. For women, at least, movement and and the ability to actually run was very restricted for them um, because of their children, okay? And, and, and so that's, that's one of the ways that gender actually absolutely impacts the film um, in terms of control, this notion of, of selling slaves. Another mode of control that we see very early on um, is with Christianity. Um, we see, you know, Reverend Green, he, he, and I think maybe the second scene in the film, he's opening, it's opening up with um, a, a sermon. He's preaching, you know, slaves honor your earthly masters and he's likening you know servitude and obedience um, to their masters to their obedience and servitude to god and to christianity um and so we see this dichotomy you know of 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 these enslaved africans all right and that's what they are you know um praying to the same god as their masters okay and, and so there's there's um there's tension there all right there's uh, a bit of contradiction some might may say and so that talks speaks to the the enslaved um experience as a whole but one thing we do see out of this we see it's the origins of the black church um and and, and this portrayal at the beginning of the movie is just one side the film does a really good job of showing um how giving a holistic view of how the church operated um, historically. Uh, so we see that, you know, the church has always been a universal institution of black empowerment um, for the black community. The, the church has been, uh, it's been a school, it's been a place where people got counsel, it's been a place of uh, welfare programs, people got food from the church during the Great Depression, all right, protests during the civil rights movement, um, you know, was based in the church, and, and the church was even a, a site of organizing and, and aiding in resistance and rebellion during slavery. And so we have, you know, people like Denmark Vesey, and Nat Turner, David Walker, Henry McNeil Turner, these men were all preachers, these were all Christian men. All right, and these are some of our most uh, revered um, black radicals 
um, black uh, liberation uh, figures. Uh, and so in the film, while we have Reverend Green on one hand in front of the masters preaching, you know, in, you know, slaves obey your masters, we see him resisting slavery as well. Okay, um, and him being the entry point for the Underground Railroad. Um, and, 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 and so he's the one that we are introduced to this intricate network of abolitionists working to get people um, to the North. Uh, and one thing to keep in mind that the film doesn't really get into is the fact that, you know, this took place in Maryland. So it's relatively close to the North, but enslaved people in the, in the South, in the Deep South, they also fled to places like Mexico and to Florida as well. Um, and so th that gives us another idea of how these underground railroads and how these um, these uh, runaway slaves were operating during this time. You know, and another thing to keep in mind is the fact that for the most part, these were illiterate people. Um, you know, and so everything was committed to memory, especially with with Harriet. She wasn't literate either. Um, and so, you know, these people traveled with no maps. You know, they didn't have maps. You know, we saw that they relied on geography, following rivers. They relied on astronomy, following um, the North Star to guide them when they're lost. And, and this these should be regarded as extraordinary uh, feats um, that these people are accomplishing. Um, and I think I think quickly I want to I want to wrap up just talking about how the film portrayed life in the northern states. Uh, I, I want to say that you know central to the Underground Railroad um, was the fact that slavery was abolished in the North um, in in the 1780s, um, and so we see that blacks could live um, in these quote unquote free places. Um, but the film does in fact glorify black life in the North quite a bit. Um, one thing about this time is in, in, in 1830, a French author visited the United States and he, he noted that racism and racial prejudice in the North seemed to be worse than in the South. Uh, and, and was this his own ignorance? Quite possibly, but the fact remains that what he was observing um, was not the extremes of Southern slave societies, but the racialized social structures in the North that relegated blacks to servitude and to second-class citizenship. You know, and so while these blacks were free, they were also being viewed as racially inferior at the time as well. And so think about it, this is the age of eugenics, okay? Blacks uh, inferiority is being, um, is being argued for and, 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 and being uh, emboldened by the academy, okay? So we see the field of craniology being used to argue that whites um, had the highest brain capacities of all the races, whereas blacks had the least. Um, and so that was used to justify the ordering of racial hierarchies. And this, re and this research, this scholarship, quote unquote, is coming out not from the South, not from Vanderbilt or, or Emory or anything like that. This is coming from Harvard, somewhere in the North, okay? Um, and so we see, you know, the reality is, you know, one thing that the film doesn't show is that Blacks in the North, they faced economic discrimination, repression, political exclusion, and even violence. Um, there were several anti-Black riots that took place in northern cities. Philly alone, you know, Philly is sort of viewed as, you know, the, the primary site um, uh, of the movie as far as, you know, um, being emblematic of, of, of the North and the freedoms of the North. But Philly alone um, in the 1820s, 30s, and as late as 1849, when the movie started, uh, Philly had several anti-Black race riots. Um, and what we see is Blacks they're working unskilled jobs. They're still serving whites, being paid the lowest wages. Um, you have the issue of immigration, all right? Whites from Europe are, are, are immigrating and, and coming into the United States um, at huge numbers during this time. The population of the United States nearly doubles during this time. And so we have these immigrants who are in direct competition with Blacks in the North for jobs now. We see Blacks having um, low life expectancy. Their death rates um, are, are extremely high due to, guess, you know, a uh, good guess is poor access to healthcare. Same thing we're dealing with now, talking about COVID. You know, that same issue exists today. The high mortality, infant mortality rates that come along with it as well. Um, and so, but what we see is this is, these conditions were still better than enslavement. Um, and so these people in the Underground Railroad, they were working to um, improve people's lives by any means necessary. And, and, and Harriet, um, she did a good job of reminding them of the urgency of the situation, um, that 
you know, the privilege that a lot of Blacks and Black abolitionists, um, you know, who either didn't know the slave experience or had been free so long that they'd forgotten um, that urgency that they still needed to have. Um, and so, you know, this film is extraordinary and it's, it's reflective of the urgency that, you know, Blacks need to continue with um, as we um, engage these struggles for freedom um, and uh, recognition of our full rights, um, even today. Nick, you must have watched the film right at two o'clock because it was all still fresh in your mind. We have questions coming in and it's about five. So I'm going to ask if maybe we could extend our time past five o'clock since we have so many great presentations and questions are coming in now. One of the questions that came in uh, was the point of the film and this goes to all panelists to respond. How were messages um, what were the covert forms of resistance? Maybe I should say it that way. I think I recognized in that film the songs. I know that quilts were used and they were hung up to um, advertise which way to go and which were safe harbors. But what were some of the overt methods of resistance during this time pre-Civil War? The overt. Covert. Oh, the covert. Um, so, so when we think about resistance, it can be anything from, again, I mentioned, you know, the blindfold that, that her father wore. Um, it could be something as slow as something as, 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 you know, seemingly small as, you know, these enslaved people working slow, you know, um, being in the field and, and, and purposely, you know, taking a long time um, to do these things. Because of course, people picking cotton that there, there was an urgency and, 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 you know, orders had to go out. And so taking a long time to be productive, that's another form of it. Um, another form, another form that we see is in, you know, um, house slaves, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, a long documented history of, you know, enslaved people that worked in the homes, uh, grinding up glass and putting that into the master's food you know, or, 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 or taking too long to, to, to serve, to serve the master, you know, so it could be, it could be anything, any form um, of resistance that, that, that works against. Um, let, the system. let me ask the other panelists and their perspectives. What could they identify as these covert forms of resistance? Any legally that we know of, or Julie, do you know of any that were locally that were in pro? Oh, Julie, yeah, unmute. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this would be considered covert or overt, really, but we know that there were some um, documented uh, instances in New Albany um, of, for example, again, one of the members of the Second Presbyterian Church, which did have free black members as well as white members. The pastor John Bishop, um, his, um, one of the members of his, of his, one of the other members of the church, James Haynes, was a conductor on an actual road, the, the New Albany Salem Railroad, and he would not allow um, slave catchers on board. So if that's not a covert or, or overt instance, um, there are a lot of instances of those kinds of things that would happen, but I do also want to take this moment to, to, to say um, something that Dr. McLeod um, mentioned about glorifying free black life in the, in the North. And, and um, in, from what I said earlier and what I'm saying now about the white um, anti-slavery abolitionists in, in New Albany, it might make it sound like everybody in New Albany was on board with that, but it really was not at all. Um, in fact, they, um, they did have to do quite a lot of these activities covertly because the larger sentiment in New Albany at that time, which is reflected in a lot of the newspaper articles at that time, um, show that there was a very strong anti-Black sentiment in New Albany. In fact, there was a huge race riot in New Albany in 1862. So I just wanted to mention that and not kind of gloss over that fact. Um, Thank you. Thank you for that. Professor Powell, any? I think, think I'll have to, yeah, I can stretch and find a, a covert action. I think if you look at the connection between the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 and the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, 
that is why you had the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 passed because people, uh, particularly in free states, were ignoring the enforcement measure, uh, mechanism. So 1793 Fugitive Slave Act really wasn't as robust in terms of catching slaves as, as Congress wanted it to be. So they had to come back later uh, and pass the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. So I think there are a lot of covert things going on in terms of non-enforcement, uh, just ignoring it and actually helping uh, slaves who escaped to free states to stay free. And I think there was frustration with that federal law as an enforcement mechanism and they passed the 1850 Act to give it more teeth. So I think that that was the direct result of covert activity. Thank you. I'd like I to have questions that have come out. Um, one, did families have mechanisms for reconnecting after the Civil War? I mean, families are a very big important part of both Lucy uh, and poor Harriet and people were sold hundreds of miles away from each other. Do any of our panelists have any ideas if there were laws to establish if this was a family member or how people reconnected? Um, I'll just make one comment about as far as Lucy. We get that question from children. Did, well, a, a version of that question from children saying, um, did Lucy ever reach out to other members of her family after the Civil War, because we know from looking at documents, just like Harriet Tubman, she had brothers and sisters that she was um, sold away from or that she left behind when she escaped. We don't, we personally don't know that. And that's because we don't know whether Lucy reached out to them. And one of the things that I talked to kids about for that, with that question is the fact that Lucy was never um, able to read or write. So we, we are lacking a lot of information and a lot of primary sources about um, what she did and did not do to try to find her family. We don't know. As far as the laws though, I, I, I don't know that answer to that. Thank you. I, I would say it was, it was probably very difficult um, to, track, to track down one's family. Uh, a lot of people took on new names uh, once, once, once they were emancipated and, and gained their freedom. Um, so that would have made things difficult. So word of mouth, um, it's one thing that we see working throughout the film. Um, and that's how Harriet sort of stays in, in touch um, with her family and, and actually knows when it's time for her to run back and get her family. She gets word that, you know, her sister is about to be sold. And, and, and that, that word of mouth using that network um, is, is how it was done. Um, and then we also have to remember that in a lot of places, especially in the Deep South, um, they enslaved Africans there, they weren't aware that slavery was abolished for, for, for years um, after um, the Civil War. Um, so that was, was, was possibly another, another way um, of um, making this, this, um, this relocating of family uh, extremely difficult during this time. Um, any other responses to that? I have a question here to all. What in the film do you consider the most unrealistic or least historically accurate or irresponsible? When you look at the film, we know it's a bioptic and we know that they couldn't possibly have um, known some of the things that they pretend to have. What do you think in this film was the most unrealistic or least historically accurate? I'm not sure if, if there's a way to, to measure it, but um, these quote unquote spells that, uh, that <laughs> yeah. Harriet had in the, in, in the film, uh, you know, they, they kind of just portrayed it as her going into these trances, you know, and, and where she's communing with God and um, God speaking to her. I can't say yes or no whether or not, um, you know, God was speaking to her. But what I can say is that it's documented that Harriet was an epileptic. Um, they mentioned this in, in the film um, in passing, really, um, when they spoke about how she had some possible brain damage. Um, and, and that was uh, suffered from her being beaten severely um, as a child. And so after those, those beatings, um, you know, she did 
um, begin to experience seizures. Okay, um, and so so that that's that's probably the biggest the biggest thing to me. I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'll I'll jump in and make two points. Uh, I don't know. Years ago, there was this great comic book series that did Black history, and they had all they had Frederick Douglass, they had uh, Harriet Tubman, and so I got some of my early knowledge about. Of black history through those little comic books. And th I, I think I may still have one or two of them around here. They were, they were excellent because they would spell things out. But anyway, this book had a story about Harriet Tubman and it told about her brain injury. I think uh, she did something to uh, the slave owner and he was angry at it. He threw a weight at her and it hit her in the head. And so then uh, she had those uh, visions and and I you know probably through history they've reinterpreted visions and what that was uh, but she definitely did have a, a injury so that's all I know about that and then secondly I don't know if anything was historically ac inaccurate but the film was highly stylized I'll put it that way uh, e even look at the poster behind you now she has the nice uh, overcoat that the hat she has <laughs> Uh, and it was just, you know, it was cool to be Harriet Tubman. There was that underlying thing. And so that's the entertainment value of it. I, I think uh, that could be a, a positive draw to the film, but also a shortcoming as well. Yeah, uh, I watched the film with my mom and her first impression was those are some well-dressed slaves <laughs> when she saw that film. I think I'd also add that the one thing that, that received a lot of criticism when the film was released was the bigger long character. Um, he's not a historical figure. Um, so he was definitely someone that was added to the film to drive the plot. Um, now, I, I am not, you know, well versed in the history of black slave catchers. Um, and, and I'm sure there's a, there's a history that someone will unearth one day, but um, the, the, the character was a bit concerning, uh, I would have to say. <laughs> yeah, Truly, I, well, I think you wanted to say something. Well, I, I, I think I definitely made a note when I was watching the film. Um, why, and this, this has to do with, with the depiction of violence. Um, the note that I wrote to myself was why did Bigger Long, why is the character of Bigger Long or this, this black slave catcher the only instance of, um, you know, sort of real violence that we see happening in the film? I mean, not, he, the only instance that we see of someone being killed um, in such a violent way, I'm not saying this correctly, um, was by, that character that Dr. McLeod just just mentioned, and I, um, I I don't know I don't know that didn't sit well with me either, and I'm not really sure why. Um, it seemed though that the film was using was was not depicting violence uh, overall very maybe realistically, um, and I compare that maybe to a film like Twelve Years a Slave. Um, and I understand why, you know, this is a PG-13 film, it's not an R-rated film. We want, uh, we don't want to, we don't want to create, it doesn't always have to be a, a traumatic uh, re recreation of a realistic depiction of violence, but I did, I did notice that the, that that was a little off, the depictions of violence. <laughs> Well, th there were two other instances uh, when the slave master's threatening uh, Harriet's sister, he uses violence there, and then Bigger's own undoing when he's shot in the head by the slave catcher. So, I, you know, I, I, I think that your, your point really underscores how Hollywood has to make these choices about how stories will be presented. And one of the things about 12 Years a Slave was people Oh, it's so brutal. Well, slavery was brutal. You want to see it, here it is. Uh, and so there's some recording there. And then the other end is, well, it's too moderate. And, and it's really difficult. I don't even think there's a middle ground here. You, all, you almost have to tell the story and then let the chips fall where they may in terms of the audience. So 
it, it may be difficult to, to resolve the issue that we're, we're talking about. And, and, and one more thing that I, that I did notice about, um, and it has to, has to, has to pertain to uh, violence, especially, you know, talking about historic, historical accuracy, this notion of resistance that permeates throughout the film. Um, they talked about plantation life um, and the fragility of that even, you know, how, um, you know, a plantation and, and, and a, a white person's um, value and stature is valued, you know, by um, the amount of um, enslaved people that they owned. Um, and you see, you know, the stress that comes from that, you know, peoples whose, people um, whose um, enslaved Africans who are, are, are fleeing with Harriet, you know, they're calling her Moses. They're coming to um, Harriet's former masters and saying, we want reparations. You need to pay us or restitutions for that, you know? Um, and, and so we see that dynamic of, of plantation life, but, and, and the, the stress that comes, you know, with whiteness during this time. One thing we don't see is the, the very real fear of rebellion that existed in the United States during this time. Uh, and so in this era that we're, we're discussing, you know, this is the film begins in what, 18, 1840s um, and, and ends off in, in, the, in the 1860s. Um, and these, uh, the film doesn't take place too far from, you know, um, slave rebellions like Nat Turner's, you know, which took place in the 1930s, uh, Denmark Vesey um, conspiracy, um, David Walker's appeal. Um, was written, um, you know, not too long before this movie. And David Walker, he was a he was a free black man uh, living in the north. Um, he was a preacher, um, but he wrote a number of, um, of of manifestos, essentially calling upon um, free blacks and enslaved blacks um, to uh, resort to violent rebellion to gain their freedom. Um, and so, you know, these, these notions of rebellion were right there along um, with these arguments um, about, you know, the, the power that slave states were gaining in Congress. These, these political discussions um, were definitely including, um, you know, these, these, these instances of black political um, voices being heard through rebellion. Um, so that's one thing I would have, I would have uh, liked to see more of in the film. I hadn't realized that she had led the Black Regiment in South Carolina. I didn't know that part of her history. Um, and I honestly, I don't know, were the soldiers who fought on the Union side freed from given um, stipends at the end of the war? Were they given anything, um, any acknowledgement of their service? They were supposed to be. Um, and, and so, you know, one thing about, about this era is, you know, some people did, some people didn't on, on, and, and the United States government obviously, um, didn't, didn't meet a lot of the promises, um, that they made to a lot of blacks during this time. Uh, one thing that's for sure is that Harriet Tubman, uh, who, who had worked, um, for the union as a spy and, and led this, um, Kambahi River raid that she's so famous for. Um, saving, you know, hundreds of, of enslaved people, uh, she was never paid for her services. Um, and, and in fact, you know, it, it took her 20 years to, to, to gain uh, some sort of um, financial payment uh, for her services. And, and her services, her, her services were only, um, excuse me, she was only paid due to the fact that uh, she was a widower. She married a, 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 an African-American uh, Union soldier um, who actually died. And so she received his pension. Um, and so that's the only, only form of payment that she actually received, even though um, calls for her to be paid for her service were brought to Congress. Um, and so it, it's, it's very interesting today, she's, she's being put on the $20 bill um, after all of that. Yeah. I had no idea about that, Dr. McLeod. Thanks for telling me that because we always tell about Lucy Higgs Nichols and how um, it took seven years of petitioning Congress for her to receive a pension. Mm -hmm. uh, and she did receive that pension. So I'm really shocked to hear that Harriet Tubman didn't. I would really like to hear uh, some more questions and comments from our audience. We do have a live audience. Um, and I guess I'm hoping to regenerate some of the energy that we would have in a face-to-face, -face, even though this is a video uh, conferencing here. But I'd like to hear your opinions, audience, of what you saw or what you took away from the film area today. 
And I know there's a bit of a delay from a live Facebook screaming to um, our panel here, but we'll continue to talk for a few minutes to get you to come up with some thoughts and ideas that you want to share with us. Um, the families, I was, uh, I was a little surprised, and this is the third time I've seen this film. And so I think the Harriet persona just, it took me three views to figure this out, but she was married to John by permission uh, of the slave owner. Um, and the, the lawyer that they hired, just that paperwork meant nothing in the South or in Maryland, they weren't exactly in the South. I don't understand. <laughs> I guess I don't understand. Um, I do know that children born to the slave mothers became property of the owners. Uh, but what could they have done if it was just torn up in front of them? I mean, there were no carbon copies, Xerox machines, or faxes, and apparently they had been waiting a long time for that letter to come. And as Dr. Uh, Professor Powell has said, there were no legal means for slaves to, um, to have any sort of voice. S running away would have been the only way. Is that, am I right about that? I mean, people wrote in their wills, when somebody gets a certain age, they should be free. That may or may not have happened for their children. Well, it goes back to the absolute right of the owner to determine the destiny of his property. Uh, and you have a whole series of cases saying that, as well as acts of Congress. And, and even apart from that, the law has to be activated by people who believe in its legitimacy. And since white slave owners thought that they had the absolute right, you could litigate all you want to in the court and they just say, I'm gonna ignore it. Uh, you know, it's a similar scenario. I teach uh, race and the law, uh, Andrew Johnson, uh, some of the cases with uh, indigenous people, they would have a treaty, they would have clearly set out sovereignty and, and treaty between the United States. And a number of times he just said, I'm going to ignore it. So that there's no self-actuating component to the law. People have to believe in the law in order for it to work. And the white plantation owner, if it threatens uh, his livelihood, his privilege, uh, his subordination of his codified property, commodified property, uh, then he's not going to honor it and that's exactly what happened in the movie and so that shows how black people over keep continuing to make america act in a way that it, it really should and it never really had oops we lost you you've gone on mute okay i'm like you're, you're back better <laughs> yes yes just kind of you have a shaky internet did you hear everything i said or should I? no please on um, the last couple of statements I, we lost uh well the law has to have the legitimacy behind it of people trusting in it and uh while african americans did and tried to go through the process in the right way if everyone does not believe in that law it's not going to work and so when he tears up this paper uh, he's saying, I have the absolute right to determine your destiny. And this paper may be legal. I think he recognizes that it's legal. That's why he tears it up to show you that, yeah, the law says this, but it has to be actualized. And there's no one here, no framework here to actualize that for you. And then I said, African-Americans through history have had that faith in mm -hmm. a system that doesn't work and always trying to make it work. Thank you. I think we've seen mistrust in those systems uh, very recently. I have two comments here. One, Harriet died in 1913. My mother was born in 1915. I'm that close to slavery. And a question here, the character Walter, was he true? And if so, did he stay with Harriet? Or was that something to embellish the story, you think? Which character was Walter? Walter was the young man with the feather in his hat. And he became her assistant because he viewed her as praying to God and God answering her prayers. 
actually talking to her during those spells. That brings another point up. I don't know if he was real or not, but I didn't believe his southern uh, sudden conversion from working with uh, the other black slave catcher. He Bigger. sees that, that was a bit, that was a bit much. I, I wish it was true like that. I hope I hope that it was, but I, I couldn't really believe that the way it went down because he he changed overnight almost. Uh, yeah, literally overnight, and then pretends that he didn't track Harriet, uh, takes a beating for it, and then joins up. So that was a little bit much. Well, he made a statement that you were talking to God, and God seems to be talking back to you, and maybe you could introduce us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a few things to say myself, he said. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, it is uh, about 25 after 5, and... I don't have any more comments or questions coming in. Um, I want to thank you all for being here today and actually going over on the time. Um, we have people that have been with us uh, through this whole panel discussion. I want to say that next week, our film, Spences, this is an Oscar-winning film based on the Pulitzer Prize-winning play by August Wilson, the story of a working class African-American father in the 1950s. Denzel Washington starred in, produced and directed this film. The running time is two hours and 19 minutes with a two hour start time. It will end at 419. So our panel discussion will start at 430 next week. If you've not registered for the film, we still have a few slots left, not many. Registration closes at four o'clock on Friday before each of the films in our series. It's different this year because we don't own the streaming rights. We have to purchase them and we have to play by their rules. If you've not registered, you can do that through the Louisville Free Public Library website. Um, that's https colon backslash backslash wwlfpl.org backslash AAF, that's African American History, AAH Films or call 502-574-1623. Um, want to give lots and lots of thanks and kudos from Paul Burns to our panelists in discussion. Um, I wanna thank our audience today. It's a bit different than what we've done in the past, but you've shown up and on the survey questions, you'll be asked how many of you have been with us before in the previous years. Um, do the panelists want to say anything before we close out for tonight? Nothing other than thank you so much for having me again. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed meeting you, Julie, and always good to see you, Nick. And congratulations on your position. So proud of you and uh, keep up the good work, everyone. I'm just uh, happy to be here. Thanks again for the invitation. You know, the audience is saying thank you to you guys. Uh, to the panelists and for the information that you shared in the discussion. So they're really appreciating uh, you're sharing your time with us um, and enjoying the film. You guys be safe. See you next time. Um, and I am so glad that we could have everybody from New Albany to Louisville to New Jersey on our panel to say that everybody's safe and happy. And I want you to continue that. Goodbye, everybody. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you. you.